probably 10 days or so. He's been really, I guess I needed that week off. <laughs> There's a reason. He wanted me, even though I was struggling with my health, but it was a good time to be in the Lord and just, and just rest, because sometimes you need that rest. And so this whole week, the Lord, I was just asking, what is it that you want to speak? Because it's so important to, to know what he wants to speak. I, mean, I can speak a lot of things, but it, it's better to, to minister what he is saying and what he wants to say to our hearts. So I had a subject, and I was kind of like not really into it. I was like, mm, I don't know, I don't know, Lord, what is it that you want to do? And, and on Thursday at 5 in the morning when I woke up, the Lord says, speak about habitation. And I said, okay. So I remember from 5 to like 9, I was just reading the word and meditating and just coming into his presence and asking, what is it you want to say? And, and, that, and one of the things that he's speaking and wants to really connect with us is coming into that habitation of, of, of covenant commitment and communion with him. So what is habitation? Habitation is a place. It's an occupancy. It's a dwelling place. It's, you know, take residency. And so <clears throat> one of the things that he was speak to me, speaking to me is about covenant commitment and communion that he so wants and desire for us to have with him. And so one of the things, covenant is an agreement that you do in writing, right? You make that in writing. And then commitment is when you act on it. And then communion is when you come one with him. Communion, you come into that oneness. You come into that consolidation and you become one. So that is so important to become one with him. Sometimes we can be scattered here, there, and everywhere. Have you ever had that experience where you're all scattered? Your mind is over here, your heart is over there. I think we all have experienced that, right? You know, you can be present physically somewhere, right? But you have no presence, right? And so, um, as, as a person that I'm a, I'm a seer feeling, I know the atmosphere, I know what's around me, so it's hard for me to navigate because I know where, it's somehow, Lord just shows me where everybody's at. And, I, and I'm just like, okay, Lord, we don't want to be scattered. We want him to come and to abide in us, to come and to make this place a home. Not, some, not something part-time, not something casual, not something whenever, whenever. It's permanent. It's a permanent place that we want to come, and he wants to consolidate us. Consolidate is to come together. So whatever is scattered, he wants to bring all those pieces into that oneness, and we want to come one with him. There's a song, it's called A Single Mind. You know, he says, I want to be a single mind. That's my heart's desire. You know, that is my aim. That's my longing, you know, to be one with him. And for that to happen, it takes time. It takes effort, right? It takes a lot of, it takes work, you know, and it takes your time to really desire it. Okay, so we're going to go to Ephesians 2, 19, 22. I'll have it here. If you want to go in your Bibles, you can probably highlight it or put notes on it. I think it's important to always read the word. The word is so important. We need to be people of the word. We need, we cannot just be, just relying on whoever comes on Friday to teach, and then that's when you open your Bible. You ha it has to be, it's bread every day. It's your daily bread. He is our daily bread. And so the word has to be like that. When you eat in the morning, you eat, right? You're hungry. That same hunger and passion has to be birthed in us to want more of him. So it's so important. So Ephesians 2, 19, 22 says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that wonderful? We are a family. That's what he's saying. We're a family. Having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, which is the head. He is the head, and we are the members, in whom the whole building being filtered together, fitted together, we're all coming together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Amen. Okay? And, and when we talk about holiness, a lot of people have a hard time with that. Holiness. The word says, be holy, so, you know, be holy because I'm holy. And that's what he wants us to, this temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And this is how you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So it's so important. There's so much here for us to really feed on and to really, you know, uh, meditate on how he wants us to be that place in that temple. We are walking tabernacles, okay? We are, that's, we carry his hymn, wherever we go. So we're that dwelling place. So a dwelling, dwelling in God is four things. Interaction, okay, write it down. Interaction, communication, time, and trust. I'm going to say it again. It's four things. Interaction, communication, time, and trust. If I have issues of trust, I'm going to have a hard time him dwelling in me because I don't trust. Okay, and if I don't put the time and effort to be in intimacy with them, how is the, that going to be a dwelling place? So that's so important to know. Communication, my prayer life, is not just a one-way communication; it's a two-way communication. So as I'm communicating to him and meditating, he's speaking. He's speaking. He's always speaking. He just needs a heart that is open to receive. Amen. So this means you need to get to know him. So in other words, it's not about knowing about him, because we can say, well, I know about him, but do we really know him? And as we grow and as we mature, we get to know him. So it's so important to know him and discover the truth of the word. I can't emphasize the importance of the word of God, okay? The word of God is so important for us to be in it, eat it, meditate it, Put yourself in it. I mean, if you have to be all day just one verse that is just meditating in your mind during the day, you are creating a communication. You are creating an interaction. You are creating that time and that trust with him. And that is so important, the word of God. Okay, and then also <clears throat> when the, the, you need to interact to know him through prayer. Prayer is very important. Prayer and intimacy with him is so important. Telling him what's happening in your life, then listening quietly, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it's so important to understand that he is holy, and he wants us to walk in that holiness. He wants us to, because that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why it's called holy, right? So if there's stuff in our lives that are not pleasing to him, then we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it, right? Because it's so important. You know, he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay, you stay in, this, in that place that you are in. He wants you out of that place because he knows there's more. So in whom you are, you're, so, so it says here in, in the verse that, you know, you're building together for a habitation for God. That's what, we're, that's what the verse one of the verses says, we are building together that habitation, that dwelling place. And the Greek word habitation means a permanent residency. The question is, is he a permanent residency? Or is it just part-time, casual, whenever you need him, here and there? You know, it's not how, that's not how it works. The moment that you received him in your life, that transformation, you have now, you, you no longer live, he lives in you. Right? Christ. Christ, the crucified one, lives in you. The one that died for you, the one that shed the, his precious blood for you, abides in you. And so it's a permanent, permanent residency that he wants to do in our lives. Okay, let's go to the next verse here, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 20. And it says, do you not, do you not know that your, your bodies are members of Christ? So we just read that, we, that Jesus is the cornerstone Right? He's the cornerstone, he's the head, and, right, and we are the member. So we are the body. We are the body, and he is the head. Shall I, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of harlots? Certainly not. Or do you know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, for the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is in one spirit with him. So that's so important to understand the importance of living that place of, of consecration, of commitment uh, with the Lord. It's like a marriage. Okay, it's a marriage. It's that commitment that you're saying yes to him. I do. 
right? And not looking back. This is in, the, in verse 18, it says, flee, sexual, flee from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sin against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that is in you? Whom will you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, okay? Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So basically, you belong to him. And when we, when we are scattered and we are in complacency in our lives, uh, something else abides. And we're going to get into that even more. So we need to know that, you know, in Psalm 22, 3, it says, you, you are holy, it says, enthroned in the praises of Israel, or another version is in the praises of your people. So we need to know that he's enthroned when there is that praise, when there is that coming together, like when we come together as one to worship and praise him. We're not just merely saying words. We're saying we want you here. Make this place your throne. Make my, the place here, my body, my spirit, a place, a place to, to, in, to dwell, a permanent residency. That's what he wants. In Psalm 20, uh, it says, uh, Psalm 20, 24, 3 and 4, it says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? If you want to look it up, I, I don't have it there, so you have to look it up in your Bible or write it down. You can look at it and read it. It says, Psalm 24, 3 and 4. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the, of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He who has, what, clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. What does it mean to lift up his soul to an idol? We're not talking about a statue, anything that comes before him, that you are, your affection are on. Whatever your focus is on, whatever you are, you're always thinking about, whatever you do first, you know, what do you do first in the morning? What is it, what is the, the attraction that you do in the morning? Is it your phone? Now, if you're reading the Bible, but is it on Facebook, is it on stuff that you, well, that's the first thing you do in the morning? Well, that can be, become an idol. Yes? Yes. Amen. This thing can control you big time can take up a lot of your time and so we need to invest our time in the Lord allow him to be that place are you making room for him or are we just you know scattered doing whatever you want to do you know and then we wonder why we are where we are and this is and another thing it says on on first Peter it says be holy for I am holy so we really need the revelation of his holiness and the awe of God. We so need it. And one of the things that it's been talking a lot, and I've been listening to a lot of preachings about the fear of the Lord, it's so important to understand that what is the fear of the Lord? And the, the ingredient is obedience. When we don't obey, is we don't fear him. When he speaks to us, when he speaks to us, and we don't obey, then we don't have fear. We are, we're doing whatever we want to do. We have our own agenda. And today I, I saw a quote, uh, a little um, on Facebook. It says, to the fear of the Lord is to love what God loves and hate what he hates. If darkness doesn't bother me or doesn't bother you, you don't fear God. And right now it's very clear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very clear. And if we're very complacent and say, well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, and we move on to the current of the world. There's no fear. And fear, what it, the fear of the Lord is, is not a healthy fear of the Lord is, is for us not feeling that he won't be there for us, that, he, that he's absent, you know. And even though he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, but he doesn't leave us. We're the one that leaves him, okay? He's the one. He's always there. So we, be, so we need to be, we need to come under as one, under that covenant and that commitment and that communion before the Lord. It's so important to understand that he wants us to have that revelation, that understanding of what holiness is in the fear of the Lord. You know, because when we understand that and we have that revelation, you know, when things come at us, it will repel. 
it will repel. So it's so important to understand the importance of what is dwelling in you. Okay? Because the enemy likes to dwell too. He likes to put it, get into things in our lives. So Matthew 21, 12, 17, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written. You know why it says it is written? Because it's in Isaiah. Right? Okay. My house shall be, a, shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it, it a den of thieves. This is probably a verse that we all kind of, we, we, we've said it a lot, we read it a lot, and understanding, you know, when Jesus went into the temple, I don't think he was very nice. <laughs> you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do that, and you move all those things. No, like he overturned the table. Like he was, he had a righteous anger. Have you ever have experienced a righteous anger? That you feel like just taking out your sword? The Lord tells you, it's time to take out your sword. Sword of the word of God. Because he said, it is written. Why did he use the word? Right? To establish. And I can imagine all the people running and getting offended and getting hurt. Right? Because they were making all that a place of business. And they were not making, the temple was made for it to be a prayer, a place of prayer. Right? And it's the same thing with us. We are that temple. He abides in us. And he dwells in us. And so if we're occupying our minds and our hearts and things that are not beneficial to us, then the foxes come and steal and eat the fruit of many things in our lives. And then we wonder why we are where we are. But it doesn't finish here. Let's keep reading. Okay. It says on 14, then after he did all that, this is what happened. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. So where was these poor people, the blind people and lame? They were outside. While everybody was doing their transaction and their businesses and using the temple for their own use. And of course, the, 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 the priests, the chief priests and scribes, they liked that. A lot of compromising there. A lot of complacency there. He came to bring alignment. Jesus came to bring alignment. So he overthrew those things that were twisted, all those things that were bent. And he wants to do that with us as well. If there's a bent in our lives, nothing will flow. Have, have you ever experienced a hose that is twisted or bent? And you're trying to, he's like, what's going on? And then you have to go and find out where the problem is. And then you finally find the hose that it's all in a knot or it's, it's bent. But as soon as you let it go, what happens? The water just comes and overflows. That's what he wants to do with us. Anything that's bent, he wants to overturn in our lives. He wants to bring alignment in our lives. And it's so important to say, yes, Lord. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. We need to really understand that, right? Because the flesh wants to do its thing, right? The flesh always wants to guide you in other things, distractions here and distractions there. But when you, allow, when you ask him to come and to, to, to dwell in, you, in your life, that changes and things happen. So he's overturning the tables. So the blind and the lame came into the temple and healed them. Very simple. <laughs> but then the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful thing that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna, the son of David. And they were indignant. They were so upset. You know what Osana means? Adoration. They were worshiping him. Worshiping him. Worshiping him. And then he said to him, they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? The children are saying. And Jesus said, yes. Have you not read? Here he goes back again to the word. Okay? He's always going confirming Old Testament with New Testament. Right? Well, obviously the New Testament wasn't, it was being made, but I'm just saying he's always speaking the word, okay? Always the word is spoken out. And he says, uh, have, you, have you never read out that the, out of the mouths of babes, nursing infants, you have protect, perfected praise? And that's in, if we go in Psalm 8, you can write this down, Psalm 8 is the word that he's saying. It says, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. 
next generation is the strength. This generation is the wisdom. We need to call in the next generation. If we don't, if we don't cry out for the next generation, and this is what I heard from a pastor in this region told us, if we do not come into that understanding of the next generation, okay, there will be no churches left. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, a few months ago, well, it's probably last year, sometime in the summer or so, we were eating at Boston Pizza, and the young fellow came to serve us. And um, <clears throat> so we were with another pastor there, and, and the pastor was just asking a question to the server. And he said, oh, you're from this area. And he goes, yeah, do you go to church? And he goes, well, I used to with my parents. My parents still go. Uh, I used to go to church. I was, I was always going to church with my parents, but, you know, things happen. I got a job on Sunday, okay, and I started making money, and I started liking making money, and now I just feel like I have no need for it anymore. So, you know, I always told my kids, you're going to get a job Sunday? You don't work. You don't work. You honor the Lord. And to this day, they make sure that day they don't work. And they tell their boss, I don't work on Sunday. That's the day I go to church. Because now that generation, which like many, he was in his late 20s. Now I, we invited him to the church and everything. And, you know, we spoke to him. But, you know, hey, I'm busy, life, you know, a lot of things, distractions, right? And so it's so important to understand where we're at as the next generation. We are one generation. There's probably two different generations here. But it's our responsibility, right, to usher in the next generation as parents, as grandparents. We need to pray. We really need to pray for the next generation because it's tough. It's not getting easy, okay? And so as parents, our kids are watching us. Our grandchildren are watching us. They want to know, are you the, the real deal, okay? And so they want to know, are you really the one that, you know, do they see you praying? Do they see, they're watching you. My kids are always watching us when we're, if we're reading the word, if we're praying, because what we are, 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 are showing, they want us, well, I want the same thing. We have to, what's that word? Um, model, that's the word, model. And so when they see us waking, and my kids know I wake up early, they know I'm in, like, and they come, and they know what I'm doing. I want that them to be clear, this is what I believe in. This is the word, and I'm praying to something that is real. Okay? And so that has to, we need to model that. Because they want to see, are you the real deal? Are you authentic? Because we are the walking Bibles. They might not read it, but we're the ones that are going to be modeling that. And they're going to want to drink from that. And that's why we need to drink from the Spirit. If we're complacent and if we are compromising, they're going to pick it up. And guess what they're going to do? Well, that's okay. I can do the same. My dad's doing it. My mom's doing it. So why can't I do it? We need to model. So I think it's so important to understand what it says here. It says, they have ordained strength because of the enemy that they may silence the enemy and the avenger. Wow. What you say, what you declare, the words that those, those children said, Hosanna, the son of David. Okay, the adoration. They were little. They knew. They knew what they saw. They knew. Yet the chief priests and the scribes, they were so upset because it perturbed their, their own money, money. And also is, what are they saying? He's the son of God? What are they trying to say? So they were upset. Instead of really... They, were, they're, they're, they have eyes, but they don't see. Let's not become complacent because we can have eyes, but we're blind spiritually. And that's what complacency does. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful not open the door to complacency and compromise in our lives because it will, it will bite us. It will come right by, biting us. And, and that's what we're going to leave for the next generation? No. We want to see changes. We, I so want to see the next generation. I want this filled with young people. And us being the ones that are ushering in the next generation, teaching them, instructing them. It's so important. Because if, we're, if, we're, if they're entertained with other things, our kids, they're not going to want to come here. 
they're not going to want to come to church. You know, so we need to understand the importance of modeling what God is doing in our lives. Is there change? Can they see the change? When they see change in you, they're going to say you're the real deal. I remember when my dad, um, when he gave his life to the Lord, my dad was, uh, you know, he always, you know, always liked to learn different religions and stuff, and he always compared to Jesus being, uh, you know, like Che Guevara, like he was this ruler, he came to revolutionize and make changes, but never understood really that he was the son of God until he had an experience. And what impacted me when I was in my, I was, a 20, I was 20 years old, is one day he woke up, for 13 hours he was reading the Bible. He grabbed the Bible, and he did not let it go from the morning until, and I, and I saw that. And I saw a change in my dad. And see that, that there said, God is real. There's something happening, because for my dad to do that, that is real. And then I went to church, and then I gave my life. See, what we model is it's what they're going to want. If we model complacency, if we, if we mo model this all day, you know, I, when I was traveling, when we, everybody on the airport, everybody's like, <laughs> walking down the street, walking everywhere, hypnotized by this thing. Just saying. It's time to get rid of all the foxes because otherwise they're going to bite you and you don't want to be bitten by one of those. So Matthew 18, 1, 9 says, At the time the disciples came, you can look it up, I don't have it here. At the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so there was a little competition there. <laughs> and then Jesus called a little child to him and set him on the midst of them and said, Surely, surely, I say to you, unless you are converted, and that word converted, you repent. Repentance is key for change. As a generation that we are, we need to come to that place of understanding that repentance is, is very important. What God wants to do in the season and the next generation. We need to have that revelation and understanding. So it says converted, it says converted and become like little children. You will be no, by no means, it says, enter in the kingdom of heaven. So we need to be like little children. It doesn't mean immature, it means to have a mind of that faith and that purity. Like little sponges receiving from the Father, receiving uh, what he has for us. That's what he was trying to say. And I'm just trying to lock in what we're trying to say here with the next generation. Because it's so important to understand that they're watching us. They're watching us. People are watching us. Um, it says that, therefore, whoever humbles himself at, as these little children is the greatest in the kingdom. So he was kind of telling his disciples, you need to humble yourself, you need to repent, and you need to have a child-like way of thinking, of heart, of receiving for them from the Father. And it says, it says, whoever receives one, one of these, child, uh, these child like this in my name receives me. So there's that, in, that, there's that exchange that he wants to do in our lives. And so, but we need to have that, sometimes our intellectuality, our way of thinking, we need to allow that to bypass because our mind says one thing, I don't know about this, I don't know about that, you know, the doubts and all those things that come. Children, you tell them this and they believe it. They believe it because they just have that purity to believe. They have that, that, that openness. And then it says, then it continues. So it doesn't stop there, okay? It says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone would hung around his neck and he who will were drowned in depths of the sea, woe to the world because of fences. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. We always say that. The offense is going to come. The question, what are you going to do about it? Right? But who, woe to the man by whom the offense comes. Now it keeps going. It's very graphic what Jesus is talking about here. It doesn't mean that literally you're going to go do that. He's just trying to make a point. Okay? If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it out from you. It's better for you to enter into life lame and maim rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. 
And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter in, into life when an eye, with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the hell of fire. So you, you look at this and I'm saying, wow, Lord, this is very gruesome. Like, cut off here, cut off there, and what was left? He was trying to make a point. He's trying to make a point, the importance of not getting offended. Okay? That's how spiritually it looks. Offense will mutilate you. Okay? He's trying to tell you, hey, don't do it. Don't get offended. What do we have to do with the offense? Let it go. Forgive right away. And especially if we offend someone. And especially when it's coming, it's saying here to these little children, when we're talking about people or, or people that are, are, are still, you know, learning, you know, and if we become a stumbling block in their lives, right, and they get offended. That's why it's so good. It's so important, the foundation. The Word of God is the foundation in our lives. That's why it's so important to know the Word, to memorize it, to, to digest it, to memorize and to meditate on it because the Word becomes real because it is real, it's powerful, okay? And so it's so important to understand that, you know, offense is gonna come, amen? Yeah. I'm sure some of you got offended today. <laughs> Are you easily offended? Not anymore. Yeah. Not anymore, that's good. You'll be tested, <laughs> you know? We're gonna get offended. Things are gonna come at us, and the, the thing, the situation is, you know, what the Lord says, don't get offended don't get offended you know and and if and we need to realize the importance of what we hear what we see and what we touch those are gates right and so it's so important to understand that he's trying to make a point don't allow the offense to get you because the offense escalates from offense then you know resentment and resentment bitterness and then violence and then murder you know, it's a whole bunch, of, it's a chain reaction of things that come in our lives. And when I talk about murder, I'm talking about spiritual, but also physical, because there's people that have killed people out of bitterness and resentment. Families, husband, wives, children, it's terrible. What, what, how it escalates. So that's why he was very graphic, like really trying to make a point, like wake up, don't allow the fence to mutilate you. Okay? Don't allow it because that's what's going to happen. So we need to understand that we cannot be divided. We need to allow the Lord to consolidate everything in our lives. It says the word in Mark 3.25, it says, And a house divided against itself, the house cannot stand. So the, the question is, where are, we, where are we building our home? Where is this habitation? Is it built on the rock or is it built on sand? Right? And the sand, when the storm comes... Bye bye house, right? But if it's built on the rock, when the storm comes, when the tests come, when situation comes, your foundation is on the rock, it ain't going nowhere, okay? So we need to understand the importance that our, our, our lives, our foundation on the Word of God, you cannot just read the Word when you come on Sunday. You need to read it every day, all day. If you can, let that let the word of God be your daily bread. It is your He is our daily bread, you know. And so let the word I, I'm you know the word is constantly. I, I get a verse and boom, I look for it. And if I can't find it, I Google it. I don't know. I just go in. I I like the dice. I just like grab the word and just pull it apart. And what does this word mean? And what is that word? Because I'm hungry. Are you hungry? Have we fallen in complacency and we probably don't even know it? You know? And we can come, and sometimes when you're complacent, you don't even realize it. You don't even realize what's going on. You think everything is good, but you can tell what happens, like there's signs, and we're gonna go there now. Okay, my last. Okay, so complacency and compromise. So there's got to be this awareness, discernment, awareness. And it's so important to ask for discernment. One of the things I've always asked the Lord, Lord, give me discernment and discernment of spirits. It's so important for, especially now that we need it like never before, because there's a lot of things out there that can be very deceiving. 
okay? And so we need the awareness, the complete dependency upon God, okay? That we will make us diligent in prayer, okay? And prayer is not boring. Actually, it's really, it's awesome. It's a conversation with your God. It's a conversation when you're reading and you're speaking and you're interacting and then you're trusting. It's all those things. It's not boring. I think these 21 days that we were here and those that were able to come, I think God did amazing things. You know, it created something in us to hunger. This was, uh, 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 you know, to provoke you to seek him more. I don't know if anybody experienced that, but is there something that you just want more of him? Another, and, and so if we lack of consciousness in our life, chances are that we are sleepwalking through the perilous wilds of complacency. And I got this, this statement from a lady that put this on a teaching. I can't remember her name. I, I didn't write her name. But she says, one other thing is that we, we, we come, we're sleepwalking, spiritually sleepwalking, through the perilous wilds. And so I looked the word wilds, which is the word wild. Right? This is wild with the S at the end. And I said, what? I wonder what that means. And so I went to the dictionary, and it means, check this out. This is a natural state. This is in the natural. It says, uncultivated and uninhabited region. Mm. Yeah. We're talking about habitation, right? Yeah. Who likes to be in places that are un uncultivated and uninhabited? When the house is empty, what comes? And what comes seven spirits more, right? So we need to be careful that we don't walk in the wilds of complacency because that's a place spiritual, that's in the natural, but spiritually it's the same. It's uncultivated. For you to become that place of habitation, you need to cultivate the presence of God. Our hearts, our hearts are the garden and he is the gardener. And he's going to pluck out stuff that you're not going to like, but he needs to pluck them out, right? Especially all those weeds, you know, now when spring comes in a month or so, I hope. Anyways, um, you know, when that May comes, I always think May, June is when we do all the gardening stuff. And we see our garden all, we have to start cleaning up and plucking out this and taking out the weeds. They're annoying, right? Well, the same thing is... The enemy likes to come to a place that is dry and that is empty. Okay? We can't afford to be dry and empty. This is, you need to be fully full. If anything, overflow. Overflow. He says rivers of living waters will flow in us. Amen? So it's so important to that we cannot, we need to cultivate. We need to cultivate and allow him to have, to, to dwell in us. Dwell in every area in our lives. Not little percent here and a little percent there. It's all. Either we're in or we're not. There's no part-time Christianity. And I don't even want to put Christianity. Because the, the name Christian is just something that the Romans put to identify the different religions. We're believers. We're followers of Jesus. Right? Amen? Amen? Um, and Mark, I didn't have this on here, but this, this, this... This verse has been like really ministering to me a lot. Mark 8, 34. And so this is when uh, Jesus called all his disciples to him. And it says, whoever desires, desires, it says, to come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up what? His cross and follow him. You know, and we say this many times very casually, but do we really, really know what this means? Deny yourself. It doesn't mean that you're denying yourself as a person. It's just that when you deny the old person, the old way of thinking, the old man, and the new person is the one that comes. And Jesus takes over. And so when we're serving him, you know, he's never going to uh, push you or obligate you to serve him. Serving should be a pleasure, not an obligation. And so that's what he's saying, you know. If you really want to follow me, hey, deny yourself and take up the cross. That's what, that's the gospel. Christ the crucified and the resurrection power that came after that. And that's where we're benefiting from all that 
right now. So it's so important to understand that complacency can dull our spiritual senses. Our, our awareness and the discernment can become very dull and we, don't, we, don't dif- we can't tell the difference between right and wrong. We're seeing that in society. And we're seeing how the line has been now cut right in the middle of saying, even with Christians and churches, because, see, God is going to come and judge the church first, then the world. We're thinking the church, oh, the, you know, the world's going to be judged. No, we're going to be judged. Here, the church, first. And so right now there's a divide between the wheat and the tire, right? We're seeing very clearly where everything is. You know, and uh, that's why foundation is so important. We cannot become complacent and dull. We cannot uh, allow the world system invade in our hearts. Amen? Because that's so important. We can't allow the world system come and take over our hearts. We need to be fully full, and we need to be alert, and we need to be ready. And so it's, it seems like, you know, we talk a lot about revival, and we want, what is revival? Revival is something that it's dead, bring it back to life. That's what it is, right? And that's what we desire to see in our lives. Revival begins with us, okay? It begins with us. So thinking that it's pleasant and enjoyable experience, but to be revived is to be shaken out of the state of slumber, okay? Cannot, we cannot afford to be in a slumber spirit. To be jolted out of our apathy and complacency to be alarmed and awakened and startled. So, so many of us are desiring, yeah, we want this, we want the move of God, we want miracles, signs and wonders and everything. First, God wants to do it in your life first. He wants to revive your heart and he wants to check us out. Are we in complacency? Are we falling into that place of slumber? You know, he's very clear. He says either you're hot or cold because lukewarm, I will sleep you out or I'll vomit you out. He's very clear. He's, he's not neutral. There's no neutrality in the kingdom. I have a lot of people that told me, well, I'm neutral. Well, then you are, you are lukewarm. You're going to be vomited out. There's no lukewarmness. We need to come to that place. That's why he says, be converted from your ways. Be repent from your ways. Anything that needs to be changed in our life, it comes through repentance and obedience. And so it's so important to be aware where we're at and revival, like I said, it starts first with our hearts. When we make room for him to do and take place, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes and takes place in our hearts. We want, consecrated, we want to consecrate our lives. We want to yield to him. And yielding means it's not like you, you don't, you know, you're no longer a person. On the contrary, you're a new person in Christ. That's the beauty. You know, the whole, I heard this statement yesterday. The Holy Spirit is not an option. It's a necessity. You know, we don't look up for the Holy Spirit whenever we need, oh, God, I need this, and then I turn around, I don't need you anymore. You know, God is not some magic little wand that comes and says, here you go. It doesn't work that way. You need a foundation. You need the foundation of him. That's why we have to be planted. He says we are the planting of the Lord, and we need to be planted in his love, rooted and grounded in his love. And when we are rooted and grounded in his love, then no fear comes. If we're struggling with fears, if we're still struggling with the orphan heart condition, we have not been perfected in love. Because then that means we're still struggling to really trust. You know, and so God wants to bring healing in our lives. You know, but at the same time, we, co- we have to come to a place that, yes, I need healing, and what am I going to do about it? You know, I remember a wise man told me once, you need healing, get healed. There's nothing magical about that. It's very straightforward. He was actually correcting me. And that, that, that stayed in my heart. I'm like, whoa, that's so true. Because I can be in my woes and woes and, self, and uh, my self-pityness and all the things that happened in my past. And I can be, you know, dwelling in that place. But he doesn't want you to dwell in those places anymore. That, the past is done. But what you can do is say, you know what? He is my healer. I receive, your, I receive my healing, I'm healed, and I move on. I don't get stuck in that place. Oh, I still need healing, I still need healing. Yeah, well, he's your healer, so partake from the healing, right? Partake with that, and that's, 
That's through the time that you come before him, that interaction, that time that you come and you communicate with him. And whenever you're hurt or you're <coughs> wounded, you, you put it at the cross. Put it at the cross. The cross of Jesus. Here you go. It's all yours. You took it at the cross. Everything was done. Everything was finished. He took all my pain. He took away all my traumas. We need to come to that place. I'm out of that place of always being at that you know, we become stagnant, okay? And we need to be uprooted from there and be rooted and grounded in his love. And there we're going to give good fruit. Amen? Yeah. So the question is, are we going to allow him to dwell in every area in our life? Not only little pieces in here and there. This is, this is a full-time thing, okay? It's not part-time or casual you know, or friends with benefits. Oh dear. You know, I, you give me this and I'll give you that. But that's not how it works with him. You know, whether, whether your prayer or answer, now he always answers prayers. It's probably not when you want it. There's no microwave, there's no, you know, it's not express, you know. He'll answer when it's the right time. When we're in the right time, right? But whether I get it or not, that shouldn't change your foundation. Okay? That shouldn't change your foundation. And the problem today is a lot of people, you know, it can be many years in the Lord, and when they don't get what they want, they get mad at God. It's God's fault. I'm mad, I'm offended, I'm done. He's not real. Then the foundation wasn't really, it was on the sand. See, when, when trials come, you know, we all go through stuff. I know I went through things when I had COVID and everything. I was even questioning, like, why me? Okay, you know. But you know what? I said, no, I'm not going to go there. Because my foundation was being checked. It was being tested. Right? And when it's tested, it's a little shaking happening. And I said, no, it's okay, Lord, you're with me. Huh. So there you go, and the enemy has to flee. Because the moment I open the door to say why this and why that, when we have the why in our mouth, then we have doubt. We have doubt in our lives, doubt in the things that he's done. And I've learned. And that was a stepping stone for me to grow. The question is, are you growing? How's your foundation? Is there complacency in your life? You know, I think it's time to, to wake up, church time to wake up we cannot afford to be like the 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 wind the, the sea that goes one end to another that's unstable in all your ways you can't be unstable you need to be stable focus yeah you're, you're gonna be shaken but you know that he is your rock of your salvation amen amen why don't we all stand honey if you can go to the piano we're going to minister yeah thank you lord